This is Phil Copeman with a tutorial on dependability for embedded systems. Some things have a reputation for being dependable. For example, the Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone National Park can be counted upon to erupt on a regular basis. If you want your embedded system to be dependable, you need to avoid the following anti-patterns. You have a problem with system dependability if you do not have a written concrete dependability goal in your system requirements. That's because if it's not written down, probably you won't get it. You might also have a problem if your dependability approach confuses the quite different concepts of a reliability type system versus an availability type system. And finally, you probably have a dependability problem if the effective mission time for a critical subsystem is the life of the product instead of something more like a few hours or a few days of operation. Dependability boils down to asking whether you can actually trust your system. It is an umbrella term including many different properties. One key property is availability, which is the fraction of uptime for your system. Another quite different property is reliability. Reliability is the probability that a system will successfully complete a mission of a particular duration. Other dependability properties that are beyond the scope of this discussion include maintainability, confidentiality, integrity, and safety. Generically speaking, availability is about uptime. When we think of availability, we often think about how long a system has been up since the last crash. But that's only part of the story, because you also need to take into account how long the outage lasts. Availability is defined as the amount of uptime divided by the total time. So availability is a number such as 99.1% uptime. While you'd hope that any computer system has availability of 90% or at least 99%, Getting much past that starts becoming surprisingly difficult. In general, the following factors affect the practical limit on availability. The frequency of system failures does have an obvious effect on availability, because availability doesn't even become a problem if the system never fails. Redundancy can improve availability, because if you have one component that fails, another redundant component can take over for it. Just as important to availability is detection and repair time. That's because how long the system is down after it fails also affects the availability. This includes not only the time to repair the component, but the whole sequence of events running through detecting that the system has actually failed, diagnosing what the failure is, repairing the component, and then restoring the system to operation. Even if you have a hot spare installed in your system, it might take time to reconfigure the system to that redundant component and then resume operation. The problem is that all that time counts as part of the downtime. As a practical matter, 99.999% availability, which is called five nines, is considered high availability. This may not sound that impressive, until you consider what it means in terms of actual time during a calendar year of operation. A 5.9 system has a downtime budget of only five minutes per year. So as a practical matter, that means you only get to do one or two system reboots during the year and you've consumed your budget. Some systems, such as telecommunication switches, shoot for six nines of reliability, which is 31.5 seconds of downtime per year. That's only about two and a half seconds of downtime a month. With that kind of downtime budget, even an occasional maintenance reboot of your system will cause you to fall short of the availability target. In general, to get high availability, you need to make sure your system is never brought down for anything except a catastrophic component failure. That's why on high availability enterprise systems, you see an emphasis on things such as on-the-fly software updates without reboot, redundant power supplies, and hot swap of components, so you can perform maintenance on the system without ever taking it down. Reliability is a much narrower concept than dependability, 
and has a mathematical formulation. In contrast to availability, reliability is the probability that the system will still be working at the end of a particular mission. The reliability R of t is the reliability at time t. The idea of a mission is you can think of an airplane taking off from an airport with a 12-hour flight plan. In that situation, t is 12 hours, and r of t is the probability that the aircraft will complete that 12-hour mission without having to abort the flight. There are some assumptions behind that mission time t. We need to assume that between each mission, any broken components are repaired and a complete diagnostic is performed so that any redundancy that we're counting on to improve reliability is still there. In other words, we assume that every mission starts with a perfect fault-free system. The final term in the reliability equation is the failure rate, lambda, which is expressed in failures per hour. There is an assumption of random independent failures, which is generally useful for electronic components and computers, but might not apply to everything, especially mechanical components. An issue with lambda is that a constant failure rate is a bit of fiction. If we look at a graph of failure rate versus component age, often called a bathtub curve, we see that the constant failure rate is only true during the middle of the component life. At the beginning, components have a high failure rate due to manufacturing defects that manage to pass tests but make the component wear out very quickly. This is often called the burn-in phase and can last one hour or 10 hours or 100 hours, depending on the system. After burn-in, the useful product life does indeed provide a more or less constant lambda value. But we also need to worry about the end of product life, where the lambda value increases as components begin to wear out due to use and age. It's important to note that the component age axis is logarithmic, so the burn-in period is relatively short, while the end-of-life period is a very long, slow ramp-up. But at some point, components wear out and need to be discarded or replaced because their lambda is no longer the lambda you used for your reliability equations. Considering only the flat part of the curve, we come up with an equation that gives the useful product life reliability. Because we assumed that failures were random and independent, we can use an exponential form to predict reliability. The equation is r of t equals e to the minus lambda t. The implication of this exponential equation is that it is much harder to successfully complete a long mission than a short mission. Intuitively, what this is showing you is that getting lucky for a bunch of hours in a row, where lucky means no failure, is a lot harder than only getting lucky for one hour. This graph shows a reliability curve for an example of one failure every million operating hours. As you can see, long missions are unreliable. Note the very steep increase as missions become longer than even a few hours. Thus, if you need to run a lot of long missions, you need very aggressively low values of lambda, much lower than 10 to the minus 6 per hour at the system level. Some systems operate continuously, so the idea of a mission is a little tricky. What you need to do is occasionally take the system offline to do diagnostic tests to restart the mission clock. Often you do that by having two systems, a primary and a standby, and switching the primary and the standby back and forth so that the offline one of the redundant pair can be diagnosed and restart its mission. As we can see, getting good reliability is all about having a really small lambda. If you want to improve your lambda, there's some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that a lambda of once per million hours is not unusual for an electronic component. And the even worse news is that if you have a life critical system, you have to do a lot better than one failure per million hours for almost any application. The origins of figuring out how to solve this dilemma go back to World War II. V2 rockets were very large, very complicated, and had a high failure rate, meaning that they tended to explode in flight. For a while, the approach was, after each flight, figure out which component failed and make that component stronger. That helped a little, but rockets kept blowing up all the same. 
Eventually, a mathematical formulation of the situation revealed that making an individual component better would never result in a very high reliability. This concept is called serial reliability. While complex systems may have tens or hundreds or thousands of components, we're just going to consider three components to illustrate the concept. This diagram shows the idea that if any of the three components in the system fails, the whole system will fail because the line from left to right will be broken. In other words, all three components have to work for the system to work. The problem with this approach is that even if you get really good components, you can't get ultra-high reliability from a probability point of view. For your system to work, you have to get lucky, and all three of the components have to work. In mathematical form, this is a probability equation by saying that component 1 has to work and component 2 has to work and component 3 has to work. So that means multiplying the reliability for all three components to get the system reliability. Reliability numbers are probabilities less than 1, and when you multiply numbers less than 1 together, the result gets smaller instead of bigger. So even if your components are really quite good, by the time you multiply together a bunch of 0.9 somethings, you're going to get a relatively small number for a big complicated system. As a simple concrete example, consider if you have three components that are 90% reliable. Multiplying them together gives you a system that is only 73% reliable. That's a problem. The solution to this is using parallel reliability. The idea is to use redundant components to improve reliability by arranging things so that you only need one of several components to work for the system to still be okay. This diagram shows three components and indicates that any one of the components is enough for the system to be working because there's a path that works provided from input to output. It's really unlikely that all three components will fail at the same time, even if one or two of the components is relatively unreliable. With probability math, this computation is done in terms of the unreliability, where unreliability is 1 minus R of T. We start by taking the unreliability of the three components, meaning that the first component has to fail, and then multiply it by the next component having to fail, and then multiply it by the third component having to fail. That gives us the unreliability of the system, so we subtract it from one to get the reliability. With this math, things are working in our favor, because even with relatively low reliability, once you have a lot of components, you can have an extremely reliable system at the high level. As a simple example, if you have three components that are 90% reliable, putting them in parallel gives you a system reliability of about 99.9%. .9%. That's a lot better, and that's how you can build airplanes that fail once every billion hours, even though the components in the airplanes might fail once every 100,000 hours or once every million hours. There is an important condition here. This is not a free lunch. While you've improved system reliability, you've added twice or three times as many components. Those all cost money, they all have weight, and they're all going to break. So you might need to make repairs to your system two or three times as often because there are two or three times as many things to break. But the good news and the reason you do this is you can get extremely high levels of reliability with only a moderate amount of redundancy by using the parallel reliability equation. There are a number of aspects of dependability to take into consideration when designing a system. A 2004 paper referenced at the bottom of this slide contains these definitions and more. Briefly, some key aspects of dependability are availability, which is the uptime fraction, reliability, which is whether or not you can complete a mission with no failures, safety, which is a lack of mishaps and loss events, confidentiality, which has to do with disclosure of secret information, integrity, which has to do with corruption of the state of the computation or of messages, 
and maintainability, which is whether or not a system can be fixed as needed, for example, within a one-hour turnaround time for an aircraft that needs to make its next flight. Also in this paper is a definitive definition of a fault progression, where you see these terms used in different ways in different sources. But the way you should use these terms is as follows. A fault is something that goes wrong. For example, a bit flips in memory, that's a fault. An error is an activated fault. For example, if a flip bit in memory is read and used in a calculation, that means that not all faults are activated and therefore not all faults progress to being errors. Once you have an error, it might or might not result in a bad outcome for the system depending on what happens with that error. A failure is basically an activated error. A failure is when the system does not provide required service, such as delivering an incorrect primary output. Summing up, a fault goes wrong and, if activated, results in an error, which is a computational intermediate result issue. That intermediate result might or might not eventually end up in a system failure, which is when, at the system level, the system misbehaves and does not provide the required service. The best practices for dependability start with specifying a dependability target. Most importantly, you need to decide if your system cares more about reliability or availability, because the math for those two situations is quite different, as are the trade-offs. If you have a continuous operation system, but you care about reliability, what you need to do is break that continuous operation into a set of missions so that you are able to, for example, switch between a primary and a backup once a day so you can do diagnosis and repair on the backup and then restart its mission clock the next day. It's important to minimize the impact of a fault on the system. The point of parallel reliability is that a particular fault can cause a component to fail, but that will not result in a system error because the component failures are masked by the presence of other redundant components. Parallel redundancy usually helps with improving reliability and availability, but at the cost of increasing the total number of components. For availability-based systems, continuous operation may not be absolutely essential, but you need fast fault detection and reconfiguration because you need to minimize downtime when something does go wrong to keep availability high. Building highly dependable systems is more challenging than it may appear but industry has decades of experience on how to get this right. The typical pitfalls are designing a system that has long missions without the opportunity to diagnose and repair the available redundancy. Long mission times can lead to high system failure rates even if you do have redundant components. As a practical example, if you're building a car, it's better to have a mission time that is one day of driving or even one year of driving between diagnosis and maintenance operations compared to a mission time that is the life of the vehicle. When building redundant systems, non-redundant components are a weak spot called single points of failure because if any particular component is serial rather than parallel, its failure rate will form a reliability bottleneck for the entire system. As part of this, consider software failures. Software failures are neither random nor independent, and in a real sense, software forms a single point of failure for the whole system. That's why software safety is so crucial. Finally, security matters a lot for dependability. At a first level, the effects of an attack can make the system undependable. But at the next level, even outages to reboot after installing a security patch undermines the availability of the system even if it's not actually under attack.